Welcome back, AP Calc students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we are looking at our video number two from topic 1.5. And as I mentioned in a previous video, this is where things start to get a little real. Things start to get just a bit complicated now when you get into these slight variations of composite functions uh, in this case, and then later on some more trickier types of sums and differences. So without further ado, let's talk about it. Let's see if we can make you feel a little bit better about this rule. So <clears throat> the standard rule for finding the limit of a composite function, it, it'll look a little something like this. The limit of f of g of x as x approaches a is f of the limit of g of x as x approaches a. Okay, now stop right there. What did I just do? Well, the way that I would like to describe this, um, it, it's been described by a lot of other great teachers uh, around as well, is that they would just simply think about pull, pushing this limit through the outside function. So in other words, this f function, which is the outside, totally comes out to the outside, and the g of x stays as the inside function. And then we would just find the limit of the g of x, like you normally would, and then you would take that numerical value and evaluate the outer function there. Sounds pretty simple. That is all things in mathematics. There's probably going to be a catch. And that catch is, first of all, you have to make sure that that inner limit has an answer. In other words, it cannot result in a does not exist. And the second thing, and this is the part that's even trickier, is that the outer function has to be continuous at that value for k. And so we have to pay very close attention to those two things. And if those two things don't seem to work, well, we've got a bit of a problem on our hands because while useful, this rule is oftentimes misinterpreted. We assume that its converse is true. That's when you switch the if and the then. If you have a limit that has a value of k, then the outer function also being continuous at k means that this limit is going to be evaluated by using this particular rule. And that's not necessarily going to be true. We just can't simply rely on that converse. And so when those two things that I've highlighted here in green and orange fail to work for us, we're going to have a slightly altered approach to this. And you'll see that coming up in some future examples. But let's take a look at our example here for uh, number two. And I'm, I'm going to read some text up here in just a little bit because this text relates more to our part B of this example. I want to focus right now on parts A and C, if you don't mind. So here we go. Consider the graphs of the functions f and g below. Find each of the following limits. And so for part A, <clears throat> we have the limit of f of g of x as x approaches 1. Now, according to our rule, it says that we can push the limit through and take the first limit of the g of x as x approaches 1 and make that our first task. Okay, well, let's see. Can we take the limit of g of x as x approaches 1? And so we go over to the g of x graph, and we see our 1 right here, and we approach that 1 from both sides, and it doesn't seem like we're going to have much trouble, hopefully, seeing that the answer is 0. And 0 does exist. And so there is no question that this limit is 0. Right? There's 100% chance that that's going to arrive at 0. Now, if we look at the function f, we notice that f, when we get to 0, has this quality of being very nice and continuous. So therefore, both of those conditions are met for that particular uh, definition. And we can say that f of 0 is going to be our end result. And f of 0, in this case, is that y value of 2. Nothing really calculus-oriented with that. 
And so there's our answer. <clears throat> so let's take a look at part C and see if there's anything different or unusual. So in part C here, we're trying to find the limit of f of f of x as x approaches c. So again, we would like to see if we can push that limit through the outer function into the inner function. I know both functions happen to be f. That's a little weird. It can happen. We have to deal with it. And so we notice that <clears throat> the limit of f of x as x approaches z, or x approaches 0, sorry, is going to be moving closer and closer to this y value of 2. Yes, it is that y value of 2. So there's no denying that, that that's going to be 2. But then we have to think about what is the behavior of the function f when x is 2. And we look at that, and we see that we have a discontinuity. Now, if you didn't pay much attention to that and you just thought, oh, well, the answer is f of 2, I think that we would have a bit of a problem because f of 2 is going to be 1. And I'm here to tell you that the answer to this limit is not 1. So here's how we have to approach. Since the outer function is not continuous, we re-examine how we got this 2 from that inner limit. Here's our picture again. And we were getting close to 2 from both sides from the underneath part of the graph. In other words, as x got closer to 0, we were probably getting y values like 1 and 1 1.5 and 1 1.9 and 1 1.9999, etc. And so from that, we can deduce that we were getting close to 2 from below, from the underside of 2, from values that are smaller than 2. And so how you're going to go ahead and interpret that is that we were approaching 2 from that side. The minus technically means the left, and that's how it's going to translate here in a moment, but it also means from less than 2 underneath 2 in this case. And so instead of evaluating f of 2, you're going to find the limit of f of x as, you guessed it, x approaches 2 from that left. And as we go back to this graph and we approach that 2 from the left only, we see that the answer is 0. And it's not the one that we could have very misinterpreted as being the correct answer. Now, if you're wondering, like, what if this graph did something like this instead? And our inner limit as x approached 0 was coming from above 2? All you would have to do is change that minus to a plus sign. And accordingly, the limit would be 1 in that case. All right? Now, while we're here with example two, I want to focus on part B. Now, part B has nothing to do with a composite function, but hopefully you took a moment to check out video from example one that introduced these new properties of limits. And you saw that we had a property that said the limit of a product can be broken apart as the product of the two limits. Well, there's a bit of a catch to those rules as well. And it says, similarly, we can run into some issues with our standard limit properties. Those were the first properties that we saw in the, on the previous video. It says, recall that if the limit of f is l and the limit of g is k as x approached a, then if we added those two functions together and wanted to take their limit, we could just get l plus k. But there is a problem. The problem with that rule is that it does not address the cases where either or both of those two limits fail to exist. At the end of the previous video, I said to you, hey, what would you get if f's limit was does not exist and g's limit was 2? What is does not exist plus 2? We don't know what that is. And so what do we do if that happens? 
Well, we find <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me, we find that we will rely heavily upon, <laughs> and I forgot a word there, we will find that we will rely heavily upon one of our original statements, and that's basically the idea of the one-sided limit. We have to make sure that the two one-sided limits agree in order for our two-sided limit to have an answer. So let's see if we can take a look at that in action here for part B of this example. So I'm going to clean up my two graphs here and then look at our part B. Well, it just says really quickly, the limit of x approaches 2 of f times g. Well, if we look at the limit of f as x approaches 2, we see immediately we have a does not exist, right? That's not going to work for us. We can't take does not exist times something. And so when you notice that, what I'm going to instruct my students to do is to simply take the moment to write the one-sided limit as x approaches 2 from the left of this statement. And then take the moment to write the one-sided limit as x approaches 2 from the right. I know that's a lot of writing, that's a lot of work, but I always tell my students, is writing out all this work worth testing out of calculus and saving literally hundreds of dollars and, and, and dozens of hours? So if we return to this, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x, we notice is going to be 0. We kind of saw that a little earlier in part c, so we have 0 there. And then the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of g of x is a little interesting. It's like right about there. And <clears throat> I maybe assume that it's 1. It's kind of difficult to tell without grid lines. It's kind of difficult to tell if this is curved, which I believe it is ever so slightly. So if you're not real quite sure that it's equal to 1, maybe you can call it 1 ish, the number 1 ish. Well, that's a little strange, right? But that's perfectly okay. Because if you got something that's approaching zero and multiplying it by something that's approaching one, in the grand scheme of things, your answer is going to approach zero. All right, let's do the same thing for the limit as x approaches two from the right. So in this case here, we have for our f of x, x approaches two from the right. And we are getting this value of 1. And so we're going to start with him. And then we have the limit of g of x, which again is going to approach this value of 2 from the right. That's still going to give us this value 1-ish. 1-ish. Well, 1 times 1-ish <clears throat> is probably very close to something uh, close to 1. I'll call it 1-ish again. And if you're bothered by this ish, you could have just used one, and it still would have conveyed the same answer. But what we see here is that these two results of zero and one, or close to one, are not in agreement with each other. And so as it turns out, this limit does not exist. Now before we close off, I want to make sure that something is very clear. I know that very immediately you notice that the limit of f of x doesn't exist. <clears throat> that does not give you the, the, the ammunition to just stop and say that the overall limit doesn't exist because there are many problems out there where one of these will be a does not exist, but yet it will have an answer for the limit. And so it's vitally important that you go through the one-sided limit approach. And this is really one of the worst things that can happen. What you've seen in example two is starting to get to the worst kinds of limits that you can see. All you got to do is practice them. All right, <clears throat> we're going to close the video and I want to introduce here example three that's going to be uh, the feature of our next video where we're going to talk a little bit about the sum of functions once again with the little twist here that you see in part B. So be sure to stick around for that. In the meantime, Keep studying your calculus and we'll see you.